Welcome everybody. This slideshow is titled Replications I Have Known and Loved and this is mainly for social psych and research method students both of uh, whom will need to for their semester project focus on uh, designing new research which you know really is important that you base it on a previous study and make a replication or extension. So some definitions first. Uh, replication, a study which duplicates some or all of the procedures of a prior study. If it duplicates just some, it's a partial replication. If it completely duplicates it, it's an exact or direct repl replication. Uh, the reason why we do replications, especially exact or direct rep replications, is the idea of reproducibility. That is, uh, in science, not just psychology, but science in general, we believe that research should be reproducible. We should be able to do the same study and get the same results again. And so that's one of the reasons why we do replications, reproducibility. And an extension resembles a prior study and usually replicates part of it, which is called the partial replication, but goes further and adds at least one new feature. So uh, usually we have in studies an ex uh, replication and an extension. They go together. Why do extensions? Why not do a whole new experiment? Uh, the idea of converging operations, that is we use different operational definitions, different research methods, different frames uh, to converge upon the phenomena we're studying so that we know that what we have discovered is an actual psychological phenomenon that exists and is not an artifact of the specific methodology we use. So by using diff slightly different methodologies, and they could be new operational definitions of variables, different research methods or different frames, that is external validity, people, setting, and time, we can now start to feel more confident that what we're looking at is something real psychologically and not an artifact or a fake produced by the methodology we're using. Also, we don't do a whole new experiment because of uh, the ability to predict. We need to make exact predictions about what we're going to see in an experiment. So if we're building on an extension, then we have some basis to understand uh, what's going on and possibly predict what will happen. And another reason is reliable methods. Uh, the operational definitions that we choose for the IV and the DV, we know that they have to work. They have to be reliable. If we're doing a, a, a replication or an extension and we're using many of the methods we've used before, we know that those methods work. And one of the major problems I see with a lot of student research is that they choose methods that have been untried and so they're not reliable. And the reason why when students actually do the research, the research uh, you know, fails is because one of the methods didn't work. Not that their hypothesis is wrong, but that they couldn't get the operational definition they chose to work. And finally, you know, we do extensions because of reproducibility. So I'd like to talk about two uh, studies that I've done and uh, you know, talk about uh, the replication and extension elements in both of them. And the first one is the Drudel study. Uh, and there's the actual paper. Uh, it, was actually, it was not word processed, but typed, because it was from 1983. And, uh, I did it at my college, Earlham College, which is serving for the backdrop of the slideshow. In fact, here's the actual picture of the college. And uh, a couple uh, locations. Uh, I lived in the dorm closest to us, OV Andis, uh, you know, uh, for my freshman year. Uh, I lived in Bundy, the dorm uh, farthest away from us, uh, for two years, my junior and uh, uh, senior year. And uh, then I live. Then also of note is the psychology uh, building or the psychology uh, part of a building, 
uh, Stanley Hall over there is a science building, and one corner of it was for psychology. So back to the Drudel study. Uh, the title of the study was Conte Contextual Prerequisites for the Recall of Pictures. And it was based uh, on the work of uh, Bauer, uh, Carlin, and Duick from 1975. Uh, and uh, what the Bauer's uh, article was about drudels. And you see probably one of the famous uh, drudels there. Uh, this drudel is witch, uh, ship arriving too late to save a drowning witch. And now you kind of understand what drudels are about. Uh, I knew that because uh, uh, a favorite album of mine from college was uh, the Frank Zappa album, Ship Arriving Too Late to Save a Drowning Witch. Here's another Droodle. Uh, our professor, to introduce uh, Bauer's work to us, just drew this on the board without any introduction. And it was kind of odd. But then I looked at it and I said, wait a second, that looks like, the thing on the right looks like a house, the side of a house. And maybe that's a fence on the other side, so there's a yard and there's something spraying into the yard, uh, you know, something flying over, like maybe a satellite, and, and that's what I thought of it. But our professor went on to explain to us that what Bauer thought, or hypothesized, was that these drudels lack the, uh, you know, con uh, context to allow people to understand what they are. And because, as Branford and Johnson have shown, without context, memory, uh, is at a deficit, people would tend to remember droodles uh, more poorly uh, than if they were given the droodles and the verbal label. The verbal la label for this is adding detergent to a washing machine. And uh, uh, so what uh, Bauer and Carlin did was they had two groups. One group saw the droodle only. Uh, the other one saw the droodle with a verbal label. Uh, and uh, they found that the subjects who received the droodle only remembered uh, you know, m uh, fewer droodles than those that were given the verbal label. And they interpreted this to say, well, this is uh, you know, uh, supporting the idea that uh, you need to have a you know, context to be able to remember something. But when my professor said that to us, I said to myself, well, you know, I came up with my own verbal label. Couldn't the subjects in their experiment do that? And so after the class was over, I asked my professor, you know, that question. She said, yeah, they could, and that would be a good idea for your paper. Uh, so I started researching on uh, the topic. Uh, I got Bauer uh, at Al's article and read it very carefully. And then talking to the professor, she said that, what you need to do then is, if you want to test your hypothesis, is come up with a way of preventing the subjects uh, from uh, creating their own labels for the droodles. And she suggested I read an article by Levy from 1971, which Levy used something called articulatory suppression. Uh, that is, one set of subjects were required to say aloud blah, 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 uh, to prevent them from thinking, you know, that is uh, sub-vocalizing, uh, you know, anything during the experiment. So I guess you could call it Ashton 1983. I had three groups. Uh, I did exactly the same thing Bauer at Al did. I had one group that was, you know, two groups that was just like their groups. My Drudel only group was just like their Drudel only group. My Drudel and verbal label group were exact was exactly like their uh, drudel and verbal label group. My drudel and articulatory suppression group was just more or less like what they did, except that I added in articulatory suppression, which I had research support from Levy. And then just to review uh, my methods, I replicated Bauerdahl's method, except I added in a third condition based on Levy's method. So everything was seen before in the literature. I just put them together in a new way. And I found that the best recall was in the drudel and label condition and in the drudel only conditions. And the worst recall was in the articulatory suppression group. OK, the, the previous study, the drudel study, was just for 
one class in college. It was her cognition class in college. And uh, so this study, which I'm going to talk about now, uh, was for my master's thesis in graduate school. The effects of gender and gender role identification of the participant and the type of social support resource on support seeking. And I ended up publishing this uh, with my uh, as uh, uh, with uh, my dissertation advisor, my thesis advisor, uh, as a co-author. So uh, what I was working on in graduate school is looking at social support and gender. And uh, I had dozens of articles cited in my thesis. However, it really came down to about three that were important. Uh, an article by Valks. Uh, 1988, he concluded that women received more social support than men did only when support was defined by the number of confidants reported and the amount of emotional support received. And a study by Berta, Valks, and Schill, 1984, found that women received more support than men did. Uh, women re reported larger social networks, uh, support networks, and that they received more emotional support. Individuals with feminine and androgynous uh, gender roles had larger networks and received more emotional support than those with masculine gender role orientations or those who were undifferentiated, that is, had no gender role orientation. And then the other study was by no, uh, Nodler, Mailer, and Friedman. Uh, this is not on social support, but a study on help seeking. Uh, it was an experimental study. Uh, the Berta et al. and the Valk study were observational studies where they just observed the type of support that men and women had. Nodler et al., they actually, in their help seeking study, manipulated certain variables and observed what happened. So, in their study, participants read descriptions of needs and indicated their likelihood of asking uh, for help. And there are two independent variables, which is the gender of the participant and the gender of the help giver. So in the study, uh, they had several uh, situations, several written need states, as they called it, uh, where either a male or a female could give you help. And then they you know, uh, you know, had the participant uh, indicate their likelihood of asking for help in that situation. So they were manipulating gender of the help giver. Uh, they were manipulating, quote unquote, gender of the participant. Uh, but the uh, research uh, methods folks will know that what we're really talking about here uh, is a quasi experiment because gender of the participant is a subject variable. So you're not really manipulating it. So what I was looking for was some way to experimentally look at, uh, you know, gender and gender role and social support seeking. And so I said that, well, from Valks and Berta et al., I know that this is the way things end up, that you know, women have more emotional support, to, to summarize it. But how does it get to be that way? Is it because that's what women ask for? So I wanted to have some way of looking at what people, what type of social support do women ask do men and women ask for? Uh, so uh, my study ended up having three independent variables, the gender of the participant, uh, the gender role of the participant, and the type of help needed, whether or not it was uh, instrumental support or emotional support. And uh, you know, I measured their gender role using the BEM sexual inventory, which uh, is how Nodler et al. measured their gender role. And for the type of support, I basically copied Nodler et al.'s uh, need states. I actually wrote to Nodler, and he sent me a copy of his need states. There is a problem with that, however, because he did the study in Israel. And so when I got a copy of his need states, they were all in Hebrew. So uh, first I had to find somebody who could translate from uh, Hebrew to English. And then I had to kind of like Americanize the need states because of and then I had to put in uh, emotional support or instrumental support needs. Now because I'd made so many changes to the uh, you know, the need states 
I needed to make sure that they were going to work. This is a you know, issue of reliability I talked about before. You see, when you go too far from what's been done and used before, you have no idea if it's going to work. So what I had to do with a pilot study, which is a smaller study that you run before your main study to make sure that the operational definitions are going to behave the way that you think they are, especially when they're brand new. And so they were brand new, so I had to pilot study uh, the uh, need states uh, to make sure that they would work, that people would see that, you know, yes, indeed, the ones I thought were, you know, requiring emotional support did require emotional support, and those requiring instrumental support did require instrumental support, and they did. So then I was ready to go with my study. But if you go back and look, you'll notice that essentially I based my study on Nodler's methodology, and all I did to make my predictions was use what uh, Valks and Berta et al. Uh, said they found. So again, nothing new, but it was put together in a new way, uh, and this was a publishable study. So to summarize, first, don't get overwhelmed. Find a foundational article to base an extension on. Uh, by foundational article, I'm talking about, uh, you know, from my college experience, I'm talking about Bauer's article, or from graduate school, I'm talking about Nodler's article. Uh, find an article that you could really use most of the methodology or most of the ideas from. Uh, then you're going to need an idea for the extension. This idea should uh, have research research support, that is, you should be able to find support for this idea from a published research article. In my college uh, paper, uh, I found Levy's article, which gave me research support for that. I found in my master's thesis, uh, Berta's article, and Valks's article gave me support for that. So, you know, the extension should be based on something that's been published that you know exists. And other advice I can tell you is get to know and understand your foundation article very well. Uh, read it, study it, make sure you understand what they're doing. Look at some of the articles they cite and read them to see if it helps you understand that article a little bit better. Uh, finally, uh, you know, I hope this shows that research in psychology, like all sciences, goes in little steps, little steps which build on previous research. And this is the norm, this is how research is done in uh, professional science. And finally, we can conclude that my college campus had a lot of trees.